Hi, this is Scott Bradfield, and this is episode five of Reading Great Books in the Bathtub, without the bathtub today, okay? Uh, last, last few episodes, we, uh, we read, I read uh, the Thomas Pynchon novel, and after I read a long book, which is quite complex and takes a lot of attention, I like to read some short books. Um, I think they're just as good as big books, it's just, and they're also easier to keep in your head. And one of the writers I always go back to, and who's always refreshing to me, even though he's written, I've read him a hundred times, is George Simenon. So I thought that this, this episode, we, I would read uh, the latest in the May Gray series, which are all being reissued with new translations from Penguin Books. And I've been uh, reading these as they came out, and I'm up to My Friend May Gray, which is probably, it's probably 18 or 20, number 18 or 20 in the series, I forget. Uh, the Simenon wrote hundreds of novels, and normally he, he he's best known, his best work, I should say, his best work were his serious or thrillers, often referred to as the roman de, the hard novels. Uh, the, these have been reissued. Some of these are being reissued, reissued by Penguin as well. Most recently, uh, I thought we'd talk a bit about this, The Hand, which I reread a few weeks ago. Um, this is one of my favorite Simenon thrillers. It was originally published as The Man on the Bench in the Barn. Simenon wrote hundreds of novels. He tended to write them over a period of 10 to 20 days. He would write seven to 10 chapters, one chapter a day. I always tell my students they're having trouble writing a paragraph. The man would go off and write a chapter every morning he wouldn't spend all day doing it either. He'd do it in a few hours because he knew the basic techniques all the time. He's always on, on technique. He always knows what to do to keep his story moving forward. And he would write a chapter a day for seven to 10 days. Then he would spend 10 days revising largely by cutting. And Simonon is a wonderful writer to read just for general pleasure and then to reinforce and remember all those basic things about fiction that we should be doing every day, but we forget because everything else we do in life has nothing to do with fiction writing. The news, writing essays for school, writing book reviews, as I write sometimes, um, teaching, uh, talking to your friends and neighbors, none of that uses fictional technique. Now, here's another reason why I like to read a seminar. Here's the, the the Pynchon book I just finished over months and months, and there's the Simenon book with, look at that, nice big, <laughs> nice big pr uh, print as opposed to this minuscule print in the, in the uh, uh, Pynchon, so it's better on my eyes, and it's easier to focus, and it's a, quite a pleasure. The writing is, is as technically sensible and smart as Pynchon, but the books are a lot easier to follow, and he always has a certain technique that he works all the way through to the end of each novel. You can read each one in about a day or two. The Maygrays aren't my favorite. I've come to the Maygrays late in life. I much preferred these, these thrillers. They're very tense, psychologically uh, perilous books that put a lot of pressure on the reader. Sim Simonon claimed that every time he wrote one of these novels, they stressed him out so much. He would often check with a doctor before he wrote them to make sure he was physically capable of writing the book. And they do really wind you up. He sets up a situation very quickly in the book, and then he keeps cranking them up. And they're pretty dark books. They're not always completely dark, but they're usually fairly dark books. And most of his characters are pretty much put through the ringer. The Maygrays, on the other hand, are much lighter. They're, they're much, they really are something, as you get older, they're very comforting books. Uh, the central character of May Gray is always in control of the situation, unlike the thriller characters who are losing control. Uh, May Gray is always um, overseeing all the characters who are losing control and eventually places every, puts, puts everything back to order after some terrible crime or series of crimes. And his routine day-to-day -day existence is sort of the charm of the books 
you know, him and his wife and, and, and May Gray going to the local bar to drink his, his, his brandies while he contemplates the latest case and his investigation into the lives of the people he meets. Now, I want to talk about this in two, I want to do two installments on the, this book. But I wanted to start by focusing on what Simenon does all the time that as readers we understand. And that when we sit down to write fiction, we often forget. And the basic techniques of fiction are quite simple. I'm going to read the opening few page, few paragraphs, and I'm going to post them on this web, on this page, underneath the video, so you can actually follow along while I read these three very brief paragraphs to you. First page of my, my friend Maygray. The chapter is called "The Very Agreeable Mr. Pike." So you were in the doorway of your establishment? Yes, Inspector, sir. There was no point going over it all again. Four or five times Maigret had tried to persuade him to say, just Inspector. What did it matter? What did any of it matter? Now there's three very brief paragraphs. When I give Simenon to my students to read and try to say, and impress upon them, they can learn a lot by reading him. They always come back, and often come back, and are very disappointed. They say, oh, his, his prose style is very flat, or he's too French for me. He's actually a Belgian writer uh, who lived in France and in America much of his life. Um, his, his characters aren't complicated enough. I knew who the murderer was before it was over. All this stuff that doesn't matter. What's important are these basic techniques of fiction that are always working almost every page in Simenon. Look at it again. So you were in the doorway of your establishment. You sit, sit down. I sit down in the bath this morning. I read this. I know exactly when I am. I don't know who's talking, but I know someone's, someone's being interrogated. The man replies. Then Maygray thinks something about the man, and I've immediately learned something about that man. He's, he's a little overly impressed by authority, and he's being questioned by Maygray, and we've been in this questioning for a while, and... Maigret's having trouble getting what he needs out of this man because he's so overly impressed by Maigret. Now that's a lot of s dramatic stuff in three incredibly brief paragraphs. None of it's explained to us. We see it all dramatically, and we're in the story. Now, Simenon does this all the time. And these are that's almost that's probably 90% of the stuff I try to teach my students about writing. And it's about 90% of what we do when we read books whether they're a dense book like Pynchon or a very slender, quicker book like Simenon. The difference is, is in Simenon, you can just see the technique laid out in front of you like a skeleton. You just see it there. And when you read as a, as a writer and a reader, I enjoy just re reacquainting myself with all these basics and remind and enjoying those pleasures of the prose. Um, before I go further, let me show you really quickly. Let's see if I can do this. These are, if you look, this shelf entirely, those are the new Maigres, and most of this shelf and down here, those are all the Simenons I've been collecting for decades. I've been reading him since I was 19, and I think I first was interested in him because I saw him interviewed, I read an interview of his in the Paris Review, and he talked about his techniques and his interest in writing and how he wrote, and I thought that was quite a... a uh, oppressive person and I started reading his thrillers and I've been reading probably one I probably read a book of his every month or two and, and always and almost always enjoy them even though the May Grays I find a little programmatic and they're a little less interesting um, they're quite still quite comforting and enjoyable little books now I want to talk about those those basic techniques we just saw because I want to talk in the next few weeks particularly about what we do when we read good fiction and what we lose when we have people explain to us what good fiction is. And that's going to be a big, big issue I want to talk about, particularly in the next several weeks. Um, I've uh, come up with, I, I want, there's a metaphor, there's an image I always think about when I'm trying to explain how we read and watch, read books. And that is when I was uh, reading, taking courses in film history, when I was 20, 30, 40 years ago, when I was in my teens even. Uh, all the film historians talked a lot about a film called The Great Train Robbery. 
And they said how this movie really revolutionized film. And if you watch The Great Train Robbery today, it's pretty boring. It's basically a bunch of guys on horses running along. And then there's a train. And then you cut back to the guys on the horses. And then there's the train. And you'll listen to all these kind of, you know, these very complicated texts about film history, about how montage has brought the scenes to life and how they're learning how to cut between the men on the horses and the train. And as viewers of the movie, we don't need anyone to explain this to us. We immediately understand that when we see the men on the horses and then we see the train, that the people on the horses are chasing the train. It's montage. We don't need someone to explain to us that the horses are being are chasing the train. These simple techniques are available all the time and, and we're, 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 we're parsing them as we read books. Often my students are not thinking about these techniques when they write. They think about their style. They're often upset when I try to explain technique to them because they say, well, you're trying to hurt my prose style. Yes, I, I probably am trying to destroy your prose style because it makes, doesn't make sense in terms of just the basic technique of presenting a story. Then you can bring the prose style. Um, I wanted to come up with a quick example of prose doing a great train robbery. And here, I'm going to post this at the bottom. Here's my bad piece of prose. It has a lot of prose style in it. The bank robbers were smirking casually at the police as they raced them to the retrieval of their forbidden goods. The hot sun shining down and sweat precipitating from the hasty, rugged brows, which were exhausted and full of suspense. Susie was leaning against Roger on their respected horses, as Roger thought about her beautiful hair, and the police were not happy to be so far behind. Two weeks previously, the ringleader Sam had been eating dinner with his mother in Whittier, where they had discussed his life as a child in Sacramento. Okay, now, that's pretty bad. You may think I'm overdoing it, but I think I can probably find published novels that are written that badly. Sometimes they win Booker Prizes, by the way. They're that badly written. And my students are often emulating that type of prose, which is explaining everything, it has so many characters we don't know who the central characters are. It's lapsing into backstory, the first chance it gets. Now, you'll see Simenon never does that. And good writers, even Pynchon doesn't do that. They tend to set the scene up clearly so we know where we are and who we're with. Okay, here's my quick version. I'm trying to use, look at my special materials here now. If I can do this without breaking it. Oh my gosh, like a robot. Okay. All right, here's, my, here's, a, here's a version of the great train robbery. All right, Choo Choo. That's the opening of the, uh, our great prose narrative here. Choo Choo. As readers, we know we're, it's a damn train. We don't need someone to say, it was the 1927 Express out of San Jose. It had 12 engines and it had 13 cars, which were Choo Choo. It's not great work of art. But it, let, it does the job. We know we're, we, have, we hear a train in the distance. Now, we're hearing this train because when we read fiction, we know we're in someone's head. Like we're in Maigret's head when that man speaks to us. Second sentence, second paragraph. Giddy up, Maybelline, Rory Calhoun shouted into the desert wind. Let's go get us some money. Okay. Now, look at these two sentences. There's no explanation in there. We hear something, so we know we're in someone's point of view. And then when the next person shows up, because they are replying to that noise, we know we're in their point of view. We're not in the horse's point of view. We're not in, the, in his mother's point of view or his sister's or anybody, or anybody on the train's point of view because they don't hear the train in the distance. Those narrative sentences give us all the stuff that Simonon gives us in his opening of My Friend Maigret. They give us... When it starts, you hear the train, and whose the point of view is, Rory, listening to it and reacting to it, and it even tells us where we are. We're in the desert chasing the train. Now, this, this is stuff, we, when we read, this is what we're thinking about when we read. We aren't thinking about what many people tell me they're thinking about, the great ambiguities of the prose, the sense of the cultural meaning of the stereotypes, and what trains meant in culture in that time, and why the man on the horse wants to chase the train. We're not getting any of those explanations. We, we need to get into the story mechanics first. And as I, well, I'm trying to teach these techniques, because they just need to be learned. My students often think that they're, they're being manacled to them. Okay. 
I'm going to stop now because I've run out of time, and I'll finish up tomorrow with the next episode. Thanks.